We surely need a penis, don't we? I'd like to urge you to continue to pray for a pianist. That way we won't have to listen to canned music that is a little bit, sometimes not quite right. <laughs> so before we begin with our sermon, would you please pray with me? Dearest Father in heaven, we're so very grateful that we can be in your house this holy Sabbath morning, this beautiful Sabbath day, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you that we can study your word. We're so very thankful for Jesus who gave uh, the messages to the seven churches in Revelation. And Lord, we're represented among those churches. So I want to ask you this morning to help us to understand really and truly what the enemy is trying to do to the churches, your churches, and what he started out with the early church. And Lord, we want to thank you. We want to praise you. And this morning, I pray that you will help me to be able to speak from behind the cross. And may Jesus be in the forefront of everything that is said and done this morning. And we want to thank you and praise you, dear Lord, for answering our prayers in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 The number seven is found in numerous places in our world. There are seven continents, seven days in a week, seven colors of the rainbow, seven basic musical notes, and seven celestial bodies in our solar system visible to the naked eye. Now the number seven in the Bible is used symbolically and to represent completeness and perfection. The seven churches we're going to look at this morning represent chronological periods of the entire Christian church from its beginning to the final days before Jesus returns, showing the transmission of truth throughout all the ages. Additionally, Revelation's messages are universal. For instance, the challenges these seven churches face are applicable to believers in every age, to you and to me personally. Now, many things are given to us for a limited time only. Through the prophets, the Lord pleaded with the backslidden kingdom of Judah to return to him. God's desire was that his name should be exalted among the heathen of the land, and that this should be accomplished through the witness of three angels' church, through all the churches, which were not exempt. The call to repentance is still being given, but time is short. Down through the ages, God's prophetic timetable has marked the mileposts of human history. We have but a limited time. How are you spending this borrowed time? How am I spending this borrowed time? This extra God-given time. Have you set your house in order? Yeah. Illustration. An old Saxon king set out with his army to put down a rebellion in a distant province of his kingdom. When the army of the rebels had been defeated and the insurrection quelled, the king placed a candle in the archway of the castle that served as his headquarters. Then lighting the candle, he sent his herald around to announce to those who had been in rebellion that all who would surrender and take the oath of allegiance while the candle still burned would be saved. The king offered his clemency and mercy, but the offer was limited to the life of that candle. My friends, we are all living on candle time, so to speak. Yes, yes. While the candle still burns, let us serve Christ as our Lord and Savior. Let us be ready for his coming. Now, many of our churches in the world are at a crossroads. Will we take the upper road or will we take the lower road? Local churches are at the heart of God's plan. 
That is where young believers are trained and mature believers are seasoned. That's where we go to enjoy fellowship with our Christian brothers and sisters and to praise and worship the Lord. It is where we forge friendships with like-minded believers who hold us accountable when we falter and come alongside us when we're hurting. But most of all, churches are where we receive teaching from God's Word and where God's truth penetrates our hearts transforming us more and more in the, into the image of his dear son. Mm -hmm. By serving in a faithful church, you know what I'm talking about. When a body of believers loves Christ and commits to serving him obediently, lives change. God's truth is proclaimed and Jesus Christ is glorified. God's spirit fills those congregations and spills out over into the community. That's what we want to see happening here in Baseburg, Leesville. Put simply, a pure, obedient, and helpful church is a powerful, life-changing force in people's lives. More powerful than anything. Sadly, the opposite principle is also true. Disobedient churches are weak churches. And nothing is more tragic and perhaps nothing is more offensive to God than an anemic, cold, and ineffective church. Yeah. Perhaps you visited that kind of a church. A church where God's word is not preached. God's holiness is not exalted. And God's standard is not pursued. A church where God's commandments are not obeyed. Where God's love is not practiced. And perhaps saddest of all, God's children do not grow spiritually. Perhaps you visited a church like that at one time or another. The truth is, such decline doesn't happen by accident. Satan is hard at work in every unfaithful dying church, unfolding his plan to destroy its effectiveness. And why not? If he destroys the testimony of one believer, he may affect the lives of ten, one hundred, even maybe even a thousand mm. men and women. But if he succeeds in rendering just one church ineffective, he can deceive millions, even <coughs> generations. Mm. And his plan for churches goes beyond mere destruction. His ultimate goal is infiltration and apostasy. If he can turn a God-loving, God-serving church into a bastion of unloving members, deception, and false teaching, he has reached his final objective. That's what he wants to do. Not only has he disabled that church from shining the light of God's truth into the community, he has turned into a tool of darkness. Through such a church, he can teach lies, breed confusion and dissension. He can pollute the gospel with half-truths and even trick people into believing they're saved when they're not. As members of the body of Christ, what can you and I do to keep Satan out of our churches? Well, I believe the answer lies in knowing how he operates. If we understand his strategy, if we know exactly how he plans to attack, we can mount a strong biblical defense. Yes. By learning how Satan plans to infiltrate our churches, we can thwart those plans long before they're realized. Thankfully, God's Word tells us all we need to know about our adversary, yes. Yes. including his step-by-step -step plan for destroying churches. Yes. Satan has a five-step plan to take over the churches to basically do more than neutralize them. He plans to run them right out of existence. Amen. Now we see this plan unfolding in five of the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. By 96 AD, oh by the way, turn there if you want to, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and follow along. By 96 AD, only a few years after these churches have been established, we see they're already running into serious problems. 
And the sort of flashed up plan of Satan is beginning to show itself here in these churches. First, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, the angel, or the leader of the church in Ephesus, is to be told this. He says, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands, says this, I know your deeds, your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot endure evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they're not, and you have found them to be false. And you have persevered and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So they were, they were clear on their theology, and they could measure anybody by that theology. Strong in doctrine, committed to godliness, they couldn't endure evil. They were committed to doing good deeds and working hard and persevering. They endured, it says, for God's name's sake. It says in verse 3, and didn't even grow weary. Are you weary? Are you weary this morning? Through the labor of Timothy, they were going to solidify around the true faith. And through the leadership of Timothy, they acted and rejected ungodly leaders and established godliness as a basic principle of spiritual leadership and Christian living in the church. And they knew what it was to correct lies and to hang on the truth, to fight heresy, and to discipline evil men and women. To confront ungodliness, and recognize demon doctrine, and even by, be strengthened by some persecution. So they were strong Christians. But even with all the commendation, verse 4 strikes the tragic note, you have left your first love. And the clear, penetrating eyes of Jesus sees through to the heart of that particular church. Their hearts had grown cold, their passion and love for each other, their witnessing, their zeal for God, and their deep sense of thankfulness was becoming just plain cold orthodoxy. It was becoming lip service. First, love was gone, then enthusiasm was gone, the thrill was gone, the joy was gone. The honeymoon was over. And the Christian routine took over. That church was in a rut. And this is step one. This is where it all begins. You lose your love for God and each other and you leave that fiery passion, that zeal. And he says to them in verse five, you must get back. You get back by first remembering from where you have fallen. Remember the precious love filled early days of your church? For spiritual defection comes from forgetting. Trace your memory back to the early joys and remember. And then Jesus says, Repent and recognize your present state as sinful, even though you are orthodox. Confess your lack of love, your lack of communion with Christ, your lack of worship, and your lack of joy. You know, Christians should be filled with joy. And when you're filled with joy, it comes out in your countenance. And then he says, repeat the works you did at first. Go back and do it the way you did it then. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, this leads us to the second step in Satan's five-step plan here. This letter starts in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, for the church in Pergamos. Jesus says, tell them this, I know where you dwell. You dwell where Satan's throne is, and you still hold fast my name. You didn't deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, 
to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. Thus you also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Mm. Repent, therefore, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against you with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this described the Pergamos church. Now if Ephesus' fatal flaw was that they left their first love, Pergamus' fatal flaw is compromising with the world. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something. When love for Christ and each other goes out, the world comes in. Yes. This church was in the middle of paganism also. In fact, Pergamus is basically described as where Satan's throne is. What an amazing statement. Where Satan's throne is. This is the headquarters of of Satan's operation. Why? Because emperor worship was there. It was a head city for the worship of Caesar. Also there was in Pergamus an altar to Zeus that was shaped like a throne and it was one of the largest and most renowned altars in the entire ancient world. They also were engaged in the worship of Aesculapius. Anybody know what god that was? Brandon, you should know. <laughs> Is the god of healing. You see him depicted on the medical symbol of a snake wrapped around the post, <clears throat> which all the medical people wear, except for Brandon. <laughs> Aesculapius was a Pergamese god. He was a snake. And in the temple, snakes slithered all over the floor, mm -hmm. and people came in to sleep among them to be healed. Oh, <laughs> demon healing from the prince of demon, the old serpent himself. That was a tough place for a church. But God's people were there. No matter how tough the area is, that's where we need to go. And he says, first of all, you hold fast my name and you haven't denied my faith. Now, they named the name of Christ and they held on to the true faith, even in the days of Antipas, God's faithful witness, who was martyred and killed among them where Satan dwells. But sadly, in verse 14, he says, I have a couple of things against you. First, Balaamism. You remember Balaam taught the Israelites to intermarry with the heathen mm -hmm. and thus to become what the heathen were. This was a failure to be separate from the world. This was seducing Israel to engage in pagan activity. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what was going on here in Pergamos and what we see happening in some churches today. They were tolerating the teaching of Balaam, and they were starting to compromise with the world. Now, here was a church that had taken the second step. First, you lose your first love, and when the love of Christ and for each other goes out, the world comes in. And you begin to compromise with the world, and you intermarry with the heathen. The church and the world start to come together, where there is no high standard anymore of holiness. Even though their faith is still orthodox, even though they still believed in Christ and they still believe the true faith, nevertheless, they tolerated compromising sin and worldliness in the church, and there is a failure of separation from the world. So the doors were kicked wide open for the world to come in full force. Revelation 2.18 introduces us to step three now in this process. Now this letter is to the church in Thyatira. The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze says this, I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, perseverance, and works. The last are more than the first. But 
I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and leads my servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she did not repent of her immorality. Revelation 2, verse 18 through 21. So here is the third letter, which is to the church at Thyatira. And it starts out with small compromises. They tolerate those who teach the doctrine of Balaam. They tolerate those Nicolaitans who want to open the door and let the world come into the church and not make an issue out of separation from the world because that divides. They want to invite the unbelievers in and want them to feel comfortable in their sins. They want them to feel welcome and want them to feel accepted in the church without changing. And that's the same thing we saw in the church of Pergamum. The doors were all thrown open and the world was invited in. And once they come in, doctrine starts to change. Yes. And that's what happened in Thyatira. All of a sudden, you had a Jezebel there who was a false prophetess and was given opportunity to teach and lead people astray. Step one, the first love goes. Step two, they open the doors to let the world in. In step three, they allow false teachers in because they've already agreed they're not going to make a separation from worldliness. And then false doctrine follows. My friends, compromise leads to deep sin. Yes. And God refers to the deep things of Satan in verse 24. Mm. What a sad and tragic commentary. They were committing acts of immorality and eating things sacrificed to idols. The Lord says in verse 21, I gave you time to repent, but you have no desire to repent. Now the church is tolerating sin, but not only tolerating sin, it won't even repent. It won't make a separation from worldliness. It won't deal with sin. It won't do church discipline. Not only that, it won't even deal with a heretic. It won't even hold on to true doctrine anymore and expose the false teachings. God says to the few who are still faithful, hang on, hang on till I come. You see, this great enemy destroying the church moves very, very slowly. So slowly and imperceptibly that you hardly see it happening. And before you know it, it's happening. It takes time. First, you lose your first love, and you end up with a cold orthodoxy that becomes a dead orthodoxy, and then you open the doors for the world to come in because you want them to feel welcome. And then all of a sudden, you tolerate their sin and never deal with it, nor with false doctrine. And the fourth step comes in chapter 3. And the messenger of the church in Sardis says, I know your deeds, you have a name that says you're alive, but you're dead. There it is, friends. Now the church is dead. It's dead. First you leave your first love, then you compromise with the world, then you tolerate sin, then you're dead. And all you have left is programs. Oh, it says you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. God says. You have your programs, you pass out your bulletin and your schedule, and you go through the motions, but you're dead. Wake up, God says. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain, which are about to die. Try to salvage them. For I have not found your deeds perfect before God. Remember what you received and heard? Hold fast and repent. And if you don't, I'm going to come upon you like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come. Revelation 3 3. Now, this isn't Pastor Fry saying this. This is God's word to the churches back then. Amen. And Revelation is for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, amen. It says in verse 4 there are a few people in Sardis who haven't soiled their garments, and there are a few people in these dead churches. 
who are faithful. And the Lord says, they will walk with him in white because they're worthy. But there's nothing to commend at the church in Sardis. He just says, I know your deeds. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. The church lost its first love then it became dead in its orthodoxy and then it started compromising. And next it tolerated false doctrine. And finally it was dead. And all it had left was social programs and politics and activities. Finally, in Revelation 3.14, we come to the fifth step in the sequence. And this is a letter to the church in Laodicea. And he says, I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. And I wish you were cold or hot, but you're lukewarm. So I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich, and have become wealthy, and need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16. My friends, that is about as strong as you can state it. Verses 18 through 20 say, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, now catch that, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. We don't like that, do we? But that's what Jesus does. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Amen. I don't know about you, but I have to repent every day. Amen. Amen. Every hour. Every hour. <laughs> Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Come on in. Amen. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Amen. Jesus is knocking at the doors of all of our hearts Amen. continuously. Preach it. Now there's no mention of any in this church that are faithful. I'm sure there were a few who were still worthy, but the door's closed. The Savior is still there knocking. They can open the door if they want. Salvation is still available. Amen. Yes, praise God. But they're nauseating to God. I mean, he would rather have them cold or hot rather than lukewarm, professing Christians, just plain church. They were absolutely without God. They were wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked. And so in, and so in verse 19, he says, repent. And so, this is how the churches go. Almost invariably. They leave their first love. They invite the world in, which causes them to tolerate sin. And then they tolerate false doctrine. And then they die. <laughs> These changes come very slowly to where you don't hardly recognize it's even happening. The church changes one little step at a time until the original church is no longer recognized. Mm -hmm. Slowly, one compromise after another. And brothers and sisters, that doesn't only happen in churches. It happens in individual lives yeah. too. Yes. We don't even realize that we're changing. In many churches today, the Bible is not supreme. The deity of Jesus Christ is attacked, and the gospel is not understood. The Sabbath is not kept, and the first chapter of Genesis is not believed by the majority of churches today. Today, so many of our churches are ranked liberal and apostate with little regard for the Bible, let alone the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. However, my friends, the Lord always has his remnant. Amen. There is a remnant within the remnant. Amen. In the heyday of the Roman church, there were the Waldensians, the Huguenots, and the Anabaptists. 
And today there's a remnant within the remnant. I tell you, friends, the need is profound. We need a revival of the hearing of the truth. Amen. Amen. Many can't even defend their faith or tell you why. They are Christian Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm telling you the truth. How many of us can really give a substantial defense of why we are a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, there are too few faithful pastors left. Something must be done to awaken the churches to their true condition. Amen. And one thing that the Lord has done, he started calling faithful shepherds from among the lay people trained in this school instead of the compromised institutional colleges. Right. Yes. Now, there are two other churches that I haven't mentioned. I want you to see them. Let's look back in Revelation 2, verse 8. Revelation 2, verse 8. This is to the messenger of the church in Smyrna. Right. The first and the last, who was dead and has come to life. Praise the Lord. Yes, Thank you. God. There was a dead church that came to life. And how many dead Christians are going to come back to life? That's what we want to see. Amen. The Lord says, I know your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy by those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Wow. Are you ready for that? You may be tested, then the Lord says you, you will be have tribulation ten days. Be faithful to death, and I will give you the crown of life. Are we going to be faithful to death? That's easily said. But well, we're not facing death. Did you notice that there was absolutely no warning to this church here? There's no comment about sin. This is a good church we're talking about here. This church is only commendation. Why? Does anybody know why? Because it was a persecuted church. Yes. The spirit of prophecy tells us in four, volume four of the testimonies, page 89, that prosperity multiplies a mass of professors. Now that's not professors in college. That means professors of truth, professors of the church, professors of being Christians. And adversity purges them out of the church. Yes. So persecution brings people in, the faithful in, and persecution drives the unfaithful out. Now let's turn to Revelation Three, verse 7. And here's the church of Philadelphia. And as the Lord speaks, he says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. You know, our little church here, we don't have a lot of worldly power, but we want to hold fast to the Lord's name. Amen. 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 We don't want to deny his name. The gospel is a powerful, liberating force in every realm, and it brought social well-being and prosperity to the church back then. But the church didn't handle that very well. Whereas in the persecuted areas, the church remained pure and zealous and passionate, faithful and loyal. Outside persecution tends to purify the church and keep it strong. A lack of persecution leads to worldliness. 
But does anybody know what it's going to take to bring persecution upon us? Yes, speak the truth. Speak the truth. Live godly lives. Be a witness of God's love and mercy. And be out there living as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and you're going to find persecution. Yes. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they're Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Yes, yes. Because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial as coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. Revelation 3, verse 9 through 11. Again, nothing said negative here. Why? Because this is also a persecuted church. Remember wherever you have remember, wherever you have persecution, you have the preservation of the church. Let me say that again. Wherever you have persecution of a church, you have the preservation of the church. With the Protestant Reformation came economic prosperity. My friends, the gospel is a powerful liberating force in every realm. And, like I say, it brought social well-being and prosperity, but the church didn't handle that very well. A lack of persecution means the worldliness. My friends, we don't ever want to get caught in a cycle where we leave our first love and we lose that passion and that fire I believe if we're faithful, if we really surrender and repent every day, as Brother Tom says, every hour, and that's true, we need to repent every, always. Amen. Be in an attitude of repentance. Yes. Amen. We don't want to lose that first love or that passion and fire. And if we're faithful and true, soon we're going to have enough persecution to keep us pure. You know what? I don't relish persecution. I've had it. I've had persecution. Amen. But I want to tell you, yes. if it's going to be a blessing to Jesus and to our church, bring it on. Yes. I hope we will have enough of that vision of a church at Philadelphia that was witnessing all the time because that too is a purifying influence. I don't want to see us at three angels to ever go on that slide and first drift into coldness and indifference toward Christ and then open our doors like so many churches today, invite the world in and then not preach against sin? Amen. Yes. If we want to make the world feel comfortable in our church, we will soon have a weakened church. Then it's dead. And then no one will come to a dead church as faithful. <coughs> <clears throat> you're here because you're faithful. We must strive to avoid the following steps. Number one, losing our first love. Number two, compromising with the world. Number three, tolerating sin. We can still be kind and loving without tolerating sin. Number four, becoming, we want to be, avoid becoming spiritually dead. A sickening, number five, a sickening lukewarmness is blind to a dead condition. We want to avoid our lukewarmness. When we begin to lose that passion for Jesus and for witnessing, then we need to repent and get that back. Somehow, every single one of us that is a faithful Christian, some day as Christian, we need to have a ministry. Even if it's just a little ministry of handing out the little smiley face card. Mm -hmm. If you're embarrassed, if you're afraid, which so many people are today, just hand that little card out. I guarantee you, when you go through the line at the grocery store and the lady gives you your change and you give them that little thing, they'll look at it and all of a sudden they'll smile real big. And if you ever find one that I don't want to hear that, you tell me. 
I'd like to know. I don't think you'll ever find one. My friends, we are at a precipitous time in this world. At the same time, we are on the verge of one of the greatest witnessing opportunities of our time. Yes. Yes. It will mean some rough sailing, and the enemy will, will do his best to rock the boat. But he cannot sink the ship, because God has clearly shown that he has called us to our unique and powerful mission to reach millions with the truth of the gospel. And I'm glad to see that we're doing that with our 777 radio. And even locally, what we're doing around here. But two of the many problems I see that are holding Christians back from their mission today is so much compromise concerning God's word in the church. So many Christians don't seem to want to stand up and be counted and face the possibility of persecution and scoffing. That's not fun. I don't like it myself. And I avoid it if I can. But if it means I'm not going to be a witness for the Lord just to avoid it, then forget it. I'm going to be a witness for the Lord in, in, in spite of the persecution. Amen. No matter what evil is happening in the world, we need to be faithful and preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. 2 Timothy 4 2. A Christian leader uh, asked this question, and it certainly is true today. We see the culture collapsing around us. Christian persecution in America is becoming a reality. The world is against Bible believing <coughs> Christians. And even much of the church has given up on the authority of the Bible. What can we really do? It seems too overwhelming to stem the tide. Have you ever felt like that? I mean, sometimes I think, Lord, how in the world are we ever going to get this work done? Because it seems like we're regressing. The population of the world is outpacing our church. If Noah could stand out as a preacher of righteousness in a wicked world and build an ark for which people scoffed at him daily for 120 years, even his own family, for a while, surely you and I can stand tall in this world and be counted for the Lord and not go down Satan's slippery slope. We don't want to do that, do we? No. Stay off of those banana peels. Don't slip on them. The devil is throwing all kinds of banana peels in your footsteps to get us to slip and start sliding down that slope. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we praise you for what you're doing. Yes. We thank you as we look back to the Great Reformation we pray for a reformation to happen here in our church. Yes. Yes. That you would use us mightily in our community, not just in other parts of the world, but right here. Use our people to touch lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. Oh, Father, you know the end from the beginning. May the messengers you gave to the churches be applied to our personal lives today and every day. Amen. We pray that our church here in this town may be a maternity ward where there is a blessing of newborn souls in Christ, yes. where we continue to see people embracing Christ, being baptized, and growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord. Help us, Lord, to be courageous. Help us to be faithful. Yes. May we not be afraid. Yes. Help us to have that perfect love that casts out all fear. Yes. Yes. Bless our church. Oh God, to hold on to the pillars of our faith and not compromise. <coughs> Bless our people. Keep us faithful. Keep your mighty hand of blessing on us. And we will give you the praise and the glory. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.